every time, and I almost ate it. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. It's right. we, would, we wouldn't have noticed. Well, now I told you, so now you know. <laughs> um, so as I said, as I was starting out, you know, we really were thinking about how do we make sure we're building a path forward, and center to that is how do we make sure it's an inclusive society when we get to the end of that, or when we, as we take every single step along the way. And you came to mind because you've been doing this in a space that really is bringing out voices and different perspectives. So um, I know you like to interview. Yeah, I prefer to ask the questions. But, but, I, but I hope I, we get a chance to also ask you some questions. We will. As we'll, well do this both ways, but okay. I get to start. Uh, <laughs> so we had, of course, a prep call before we got up on stage, as one does. Yeah. And Amanda and her team is talking, and I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, there were so many, I thought I knew all the acronyms for like <laughs> all the DC things, and it turns out there are more acronyms that I don't know. And so being fairly new to this space, I, I did my reading, you sort of read me in, but I wonder for you as someone who has worked in basically every industry. <laughs> I mean, you have spent time in finance, you've spent time in education, you have spent time in the halls of government. What most surprised you as you came into this space? Yeah, um, so partly my coming into this space is um, I had wondered how we could make change at scale across the country. And having worked in policy and politics, um, I had lost a little bit of hope in hearts and minds. But, so I looked around and went, where are the folks who are changing people's lives? Maybe they're not on the front page. Maybe we're not seeing them on the floor talk about the policies that are gonna change the world, but who's actually doing it and where is that happening? And when you look around, heck, I look around a lot of faces in this room who have been making it connect, right? Where you fight like heck for these policies, you fight like heck for hearts and minds, and then the policy passes and you're like, okay, great. And when I started to look behind the curtain and you start to wonder where has the trust been lost in institutions, you began to see that we need our systems to work. And Code for America was there as a system that worked. And when I looked more broadly at the civic tech ecosystem, that really is a combining mission, is to figure out how we can make it work. And so my biggest surprise was all the hope mm -hmm. I would find behind the curtain and the second is how much we need it today, how much people need it today. Um, I tear up when we get our client voices, when they've been through a process and they're like, thank you for treating me with dignity and respect. Or they don't say it like that, they just say, thank you for being nice, right? Thank so you, you know for being subtext. there, yeah. right? Now. You know, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I'll just keep asking questions if you don't stop me. So All right, ahead. well, I'm, I'm ready to ask you a question, which is, um, you know, you came on in media and you saw that there were voices missing and you've played a critical role in doing that. But I'm curious to hear not only what motivated you, but how did you navigate that? Yeah. I, I think about this question all the time, um, and I think about it in a variety of ways. So as Amanda said to you, I, I wrote this book called The Likeability Trap, which really looked at unconscious bias and the way that sometimes unconscious bias is masked as likeability, that it's easier to talk mm -hmm. about who we like and who we don't like um, instead of confronting the reasons that we feel comfortable with some people and not others, which mostly has to do with who is like us, who is not, who shares our lived experience, who does not. And I use gender as the primary lens through which I looked at that question, the way that women are given critical subjective feedback, either that they are too warm or too strong, <laughs> like you know, a bowl of porridge, a woman is never quite right, um, which means <laughs> that we are either seen as strong leaders who nobody likes, or we are seen as amiable and everybody thinks we're great, but people think we don't have what it takes. Not competence. Right. Yeah. Um, there are so many layers you can add on to that. You know, for we were both Latina, there, you either are perceived as hot-blooded, like Sofia Vergara's character in Modern Family. Uh, people might love to go to a cocktail party with you. No one's putting you in charge of their organization. Um, or meek and humble and someone who puts their head down and, and gets the job done. But once again, that person is seen as someone who is a great team player, but not a team leader. Um, for 
black women very often being assertive is read as being aggressive, sometimes angry. You look at Shonda Rhimes, you look at, um, at either of the Williams sisters, right? And there is no greater penalty for women in the workplace than anger. Um, Asian, Asian American women and men, there's an expectation that they're supposed to be docile. So again, great to have on a team. The minute they assert themselves on a team, um, you know, they violate the expectation that so many people have of Asians, Asian Americans. I say all that to say that we're doing all this work on diversity. We're doing all this work on inclusion. And I think there are a lot of people who work places who wonder, is this legit? Is this real? When you are inviting me to bring my whole self to work, mm -hmm. is that whole self truly invited? Is that whole mm -hmm. self truly made to feel safe? Do you really want all of the life experience that I come with? And I would argue that if you are a leader, who truly wants to lead the workforce of the future, then this has to be a critical priority. What I mean by that is that you, know, you get everybody around the table, and there are those of us who are just so excited, we're in the room, <laughs> it's the first time we're in the room, and then you have someone who's like been in a DEI training, so they go around to everybody, and you're like, <laughs> I got to say something. And then you go to enough of those meetings, and you start to realize that some people's ideas are actually processed and put into reality. Oh. <laughs> and some, type, some people, like, you, you give your idea and it goes in one ear and out the other. Um, and, and so if you're asking people to come and bring their lived experience, then really that experience has to be valued and it has to be seen as a form of expertise. That is likewise something I think we often get wrong in the media space, right? Like, I will use you, Amanda, as an example since you're sitting with <laughs> me, which is that, you know, it is, it is a natural tendency to be like, oh, Amanda Renteria, she's Latina, right? Should we have her on about immigration? Maybe, sure, I'm sure she has a lot of critical thoughts on immigration policy, but she also knows about voters in the Midwest. She also knows about banking. She also knows about civic tech. Like, why would you immediately assume that that is the only subject area we can have her on? In addition to that, she brings all of her lived experience. She brings her lived experience as a teacher in the classroom. She brings her lived experience as someone who has actually walked the halls of Capitol Hill. And so, your thing may not be media, your, your thing may not be, um, you know, DEI. I, I bring all of this up because I think it is important that we, we understand lived experience as an actual form of expertise and incorporate it into our work. And I think that is a big yeah. part of what you are trying to do yeah. in this space. That's right. That's right. And it's interesting because uh, in this space, how do you, so much of government wants to figure out how do you quantify that, right? How do we make sure that not only are we bringing the research in, but how are we making sure we're bringing lived experience skills inside of government as well? And what we now know in even our early research in, in fellows, et cetera, when we bring in lived experience, the products that are created are better. The trust around what the city does when you bring in folks with lived experience is the community trusted again. And so there are all these other um, just benefits around that we are learning in real time how important they are to rebuilding that trust again for both the government and the community. And by the way, these are communities oftentimes who have been completely and totally left out. So the learning curve is huge. Um, and partly that's been a really important piece as we think about the civic tech ecosystem. Do that you have we an are an example in. of one of those people? Yeah, so one of our, um, we will be having a couple of breakout sessions on a, um, housing, a housing app, right? And how it's structured. What are the questions you ask? Um, you talk about, we did a child tax credit not too long ago. One of the early learnings in tax filing is when you're asking hourly wor workers, what is your salary wages? You must not understand that because hourly workers don't think of salary, right? Like you're thinking about like, how, what was my hourly pay today? And why can't we speak in those kinds of language, that kind of language, as opposed to making it hard? I'll give you another example, is in low-income communities, um, when you go into a, a social services office and they ask you, the first question is, are you a criminal? Like, it's not even about, are you asking the right question, but like, are you just here to be offensive? Right? And so it's no wonder that the government doesn't feel like a, a thing or an institution or a place that's for you. And many of these laws aren't necessary, many of these rules aren't necessary or these questions aren't necessary. 
And so as we think about inclusive, it's not only getting it right, but it's undoing some real harm that has existed. One of the things that I have thought so much about as we've moved through this period of American politics is this idea of trust in government, lack of trust in government, trust in institutions, some of which I, I think we saw was generational. You know, I am, I'm a mortgage millennial, an old millennial. Um, and <laughs> I hadn't heard that term before. Yeah. Okay. And as, as of a year ago, I have a mortgage so I can like actually claim it. Um, <laughs> Because it's a huge time span for millennials, right? It's so like I'm born in 83. There are members of our generation that are born closer to 2000. We have a yeah. completely different experience, completely. Think about something like 9-11. Yeah. I experienced 9-11 my first year in college. There are members of yeah. the same generation. They were, they were babies. They were kids. They didn't, yeah. they didn't process it the same way. Um, why was I talking about mortgage millennials? I was, talki um, I was talking about mortgage millennials because our generation yeah. already had shown sort of this questioning of government. Is government something that yeah. can actually get things done? It was a question of institutions across yep. the board, the same with our places of worship. Do you think that is a thing that can be undone, not specifically for millennials, but for an American populace that maybe you have one great experience, right, where yeah. government really does work, where you're able to order your eight COVID tests, and you're <laughs> like, oh, I get it, like this, I give you, this is what it's supposed to do. But then the next experience they have is one where it doesn't feel as though the government is working for them. How do you, how do you mitigate that? So I believe government has to deliver for you to believe in it, right? It certainly can't harm you, which <laughs> we've got to actually undo that. Then it has to see you. Like the fact that government services just simply don't reach certain people. Broadband is a good example. I didn't, when, it was only five years ago that my high school actually got internet. Right? So when you think about that, government has to see you. And then it actually has to speak to you and meet you where you are. And I do believe there's a big question right now uh, about whether democracy, democratic institutions, can do that. And I think that's a little bit of what's happened is the, is the trust going away. And so my belief is we got to get back to the very basics of government being able to meet you where you are. And one of my big questions for you and really for all of us is we often in the civic tech space talk about our work is behind the scenes right making it like work building a mobile app so it reaches you so there's one front door or helping people with phone interviews and really kind of building that infrastructure kind of behind the scenes but how do we tell story. our story how do we tell it where I don't know if we need it to be cool if we need it to be inspiring like what is it in particular in a world today where it's so hard to get good stories or happy hopeful messages out. You tell it on TikTok would be my takeaway <laughs> as the cable news host. Um, but I thought it, I mean, it was one of the stories that I thought was so interesting during, you know, the, the beginning of the child tax credit rolling out was all of a sudden, like, parents who had been completely strapped yeah. in every way through this pandemic were getting checks from the government and they were posting videos on TikTok <laughs> that were like, That's when that check hits and like it it made it a conversation, right? It made people feel as though they were in community with other people. There was a celebratory piece to it, right? right. And, and there were also people who, you know, that was like a fun, funny version of it, but there were also people who were giving these really first person testimonials of what they planned to do with that money, what they were going mm -hmm. to be able to do with that money and how easy it was, right? The ease, the, the mm. fact that it wasn't like I had to jump through a million hoops in order to get this done for me and for my family. I, I also think like a, I, this is not a fully baked idea, but the, um, I think often we, we frame this as the government giving people something, right? Mm. Or the government giving access to something as opposed to the government empowering individuals to make choices for themselves and their families. The government empowering parents to do what is best for their children. And I think that empowerment frame, right? Like, we want to make this as easy for you as possible. We want to make sure that access is equitable. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it's about you having the tools you need to do what is best for yourself and for your community. No, that's a that's Like, who's a great... the hero of that story? Yeah. Right. And I think the more you can make people the hero of their own story, the more resonant it is. That's great. We need more heroes. We need to bring out the voices of government leaders, many who are in this room, who are doing this work, yeah. and yet we aren't telling those stories enough. 
And um, one I of the things- I have a question for yeah. you about that though, which is do you think that, that decision makers in government understand what the people in this room do? No. They might be scared of it too. <laughs> Because, and the reason is, is because you can use technology to actually see whether a policy worked or it didn't. And there's such a fear that it's not going to work, right? Everyone I know is really scared of healthcare.gov, right? And what happened? But like, you can also look at that same story and say, thank God we have a healthcare.gov. Like, we needed that. And it should be okay that we're learning in the process. That it can be iterative. Yeah, and that, and that is life. Right? I mean, that is, that's what we're all learning in this pandemic, is that it is, we're figuring this out together. And that builds a partnership. That builds the kind of government that can evolve with times, that can learn what worked and what didn't. But I do think that when you have policymakers make policy, you know, you want it to be great. Yeah. And some of the work that this room does is you actually look at the data and you say, all right, this was great, but this wasn't so great, right? And we can do this better. And I do think part of our learning and our future is really being honest about where it's working and how to make it better. Well, in there's, order so to fully in that. there's so That's much humility in There's so much humility in saying, we tried, we did the best we could. And what happened is we learned how to do it better. Yeah. Like who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Anyone running for our office? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so as I think about your view of just the world you see right now, um, and I know we're like already out of time, um, but I'd like you to leave us with, um, as you see media, the world, as we go into our future, what, is, what gives you hope and what do you see um, that we as a civic tech community can do to continue to fuel that? My, um, I, have, I have two daughters. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And my five-year-old, I, I guess they had like Earth, they had an entire curriculum around Earth Day. So now all of a sudden she's become a hardcore <laughs> environmentalist who like, like narks on you if you use a plastic bag. Like she's like into it. She, um, she like told me I had to take faster showers. She's like, she's really, she's very big into policing other people's behavior, less into like whenever it's something for her, she's, she's, she's less committed. But there, it's the it is to me one of the beauties of, of having children, which is that she she both sees the world as it could be, and she also understands that she and hopes she has a lot of time on this planet, right? And yeah. so it's like to her, everything is possible and infinite. And for me, as a pragmatist and someone whose glass is always half empty, it's really <laughs> helpful to have this person who feels that way. Um, and what I would say is the thing that helps me most beyond my own children is like getting out into the world. I think sometimes we all get into our little bubbles. Mm -hmm. It has been harder during the pandemic. It has been so much harder. It has been hard to report stories. It has been hard to get into communities. Like yeah. we are feeling limited in this moment. When I do, when I'm able to do that, when I actually sit with people who are experiencing the things that we're sitting up here talking about, right? When they are like yeah. in the thick of the housing shortage, when they are trying to figure out what they are gonna do for their family when all of a sudden the child tax credit isn't extended, they believe it's possible. Yeah. Like, they have faith. And so if they have faith in those hard moments, then the least we can all do is deliver for them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here.